Hill. Yes, everyone, it's me, Harry Hill. <laughs> Welcome to Red, White and Blue Nose Day. Or in my case, Brown Nose Day. That's how I got the job. <laughs> Cue titles. Go. <laughs> Sharon! Sharon! Oh, hi everyone, it's me, Ozzy, Ozzy, uh, Osbo. Osbo, thanks James. Yeah, yeah, and it's red, white, and blue, 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 white, and green. It's, it's uh, wait for the traffic lights, what the fuck, what? Anyway, it's that show for Jim, and Q, is it title? I don't fucking know, what's going on? Oh, I've got a number to read, here we go. It's, uh, get on with it. It's no, it's it's text. That's a it's, it's text. It's te text. Te text. Donate. Uh, not my liver. Christ, no one would want that, would they? Eh? Fucking <laughs> you know, So it says text donate to six six seven seven seven. That's double six. Squirrel. No, different one. Double six treble seven. Donate. Come on. Cough up, you fucking mean bastard. Sharon! <laughs> oh, I've shit myself. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, thank you, Bobby, and welcome to another Red, White and Blue Nose Day where all of us here in Ustream are dipping in, dipping into the vaults of funniness and hopefully we'll laugh uh, like we used to. I'll be chatting to Bobby a little bit later. We'll be seeing some clips. Uh, but first of all, why Red, White and Blue Nose Day? Well, Red Nose Day that the BBC does doesn't really float my boat because a lot of the money goes to charities that I wouldn't particularly send a tanner to. And a lot of the people that I send a tanner to are not included on the BBC Red Nose Day. So it's OK for Lenny Henry and his gaggle of lovies to send our monies overseas when there's people in this country, quite frankly, can't afford to put an electric fire on at Christmas. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's an old cliche, but that's about the gist of it. Some people say charity begins at home and we are struggling here. We are absolutely struggling here. It's okay giving money to people overseas as long as we look after our own people. There is a terrible struggle going on uh, in Ukraine at the moment with the Russian invasion. And have we helped that? Yes, indirectly we have by sponsoring uh, Veterans in Action, a fantastic veterans charity who have taken um, by Land Rover and by van and truck humanitarian aid and more importantly medical aid out to the Polish-Ukrainian border. And this was done by veterans, veterans who are struggling with life themselves, but they are making themselves better by making other people feel better. They are a great bunch. And you know, there's just over 6,000 veterans reported homeless and living on the streets. Uh, these are individuals who need help. Uh, and, w and I suppose they'd love a room if you have a place to give them shelter. Um, you know, some of these veterans have returned from conflict with broken minds. <sighs> it is, it's quite sad to see what is going on. And, and they're at, the, uh, they're at the, the whim of the charity sector. So a lot of people say the government should be doing more. I believe the government should be doing more, but there's only so much the government can do. And when the government do it, they tend to call the shots. When we do it, we call the shots. So I'd like you to help me help them. We're going to help some great charities today. We're going to help Veterans in Action. We're going to help Care After Combat. And we're going to help the wonderful bunch of guys up there in Caister. The Caster on Sea Volunteer Lifeboat. Don't you worry about that. Let's start with them guys. Let's go up to Caster and then I'll tell you a few stories. That's them now, waiting for their check. Well, Case Lifeboat is Britain's oldest established independent lifeboat service and one of only a handful which has got an independent all-weather lifeboat. It's based just north of Great Yarmouth in an area of coast where there are big sandbanks, a major shipping hazard uh, off the coast, and it's because of those sandbanks that Case Lifeboat over the years has saved more lives than any other lifeboat station in the UK. 
There's been a, a lifeboat here in Kayser since the late 1800s. Um, we've maintained the lifeboat here since that time with the RNLI, which is the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Back in 1969, the RNLI closed this station um, to say that the, the local flank station could cover, cover our needs, if you like. Um, but at the time, the crew said, well, no, they can't really. So we set up an independent station. And since 1969, we've been an independent station. Uh, so we're very proud of what we've got here at Case the Lifeboat. Well, we've got something for everybody, I think. You know, we have a museum which has got a vintage lifeboat which was built in 1953 and was served here from 1973 through to 1991. Uh, we've also got interactive displays. We've got all the questions and answers that anybody might want to have uh, you know, put, to put to us. We've also got videos as well, which give a technical tour not only of this boat, but they show us how we get into our waterproofs and how we get kitted up. It tells us about, it tells visitors about the costs and how important their donations are to us to ensure that we're here for the future to save lives. It's very important that with the community spirit of the schools involved in the schools in the community uh, and, and we are a lifeboat station you know and, and, and being biased we're one of the best lifeboat stations in the country obviously uh, and something to be proud of and the community should be very proud of Case the Lifeboat. We've got everything from a dog show which is coming up, we have the annual Fate Day which is our biggest single event of the year in terms of how much money and how many people we attract. We think about four or five thousand people come, we raise around 10% of our annual running costs in just one day. But we also have a flower festival, we have an Easter egg hunt which attracted 500 children this year and, and we also have uh, heritage guided walks which are, are carried out as well. So we, explain about where the sandbanks are and how the lifeboat really operates to give people a full flavour of what we do. A lot of local people don't know about this place, <laughs> even in Yarmouth. There's a lot of people in Yarmouth I've spoken to. Well, what do they do up there? It's just a lifeboat. No, it's not. It's a museum as well. Go and have a look. And when they do come, they come again and again. And they tell their friends and they come. So all the time, even though I'm not always here, I'm still volunteering. <laughs> As a person, uh, being uh, the chairman of Case the Lifeboat, if you like, um, it helps me to, to see that people, uh, the holiday makers, the local community, the crew, the directors, the helpers, uh, all enjoy the facilities we've got over here. So if, if people are enjoying the museum over there and enjoying the station we've got here, that makes me happy, it makes my life easier, uh, and it makes it makes me happier, if you like. It's an intrinsic part of Case to Life. Okay, that, thank you. That was the old Case to Life boat. I know it well, I've got some stories. And incidentally, that film wasn't done by us. Well, indirectly, there's a link, because it is the college uh, that Jake, our senior editor, went to. It's the Norwich City, Nor Norwich City College. The Nor 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 Norwich City College! That's what that was. Yes, hey, squirrel. Everybody will be seeing the squirrel man uh, a little bit later as well. They're a great bunch, Kester, and, and their lifeboat is not part of the RNLI. I don't know if you're like me, you love that series uh, that is on with all these people saving lives. Blimey, you'd never go to sea again, would you? If you watched too many of those episodes. They are brave buggers. One of my old friends was called Percy, who lived in Caser on Sea. I don't, I don't know if you know Caser on Sea, but Percy was a smashing bloke who he shared a tooth with his wife. And uh, he sadly now passed away at the age of 256, which is the average age of people <laughs> Caser on Sea. They're going to kill me for this. But they are a brave bunch. And, and Percy, who was a lifeman for 50 odd years, could not swim. And I said, Percy, you're a lifeboatman and you can't swim. No. I said, why can't you swim? He said, I've never had to swim. I've always had a boat. And I said, but well, I've seen you on the lifeboat. You don't wear a life jacket. I know. I said, but you can't swim. What happens if the boat sinks? He said, where are you going to swim to in the North Sea? Get your head under the water and drown yourself. They are sincerely a brave bunch. And why did the RNLI not help the case to people? Well, the RNLI years ago said, we're not going to give a boat uh, to Caister uh, anymore because they've got one in Cromer and they've got one in Galston. But the people from Caister didn't take too kindly to that. 
And so they've had their own one for years and years. I remember one that they almost had to row out. Little old Skipper Woodhouse. He was a, a little old chap that lived in the cottages down there in Caister on Sea by the beach. And we actually got him on This Is Your Life. There he was, ha ha ha, Skipper Woodhouse. You thought you were going fishing, but tonight, ha ha ha, this is your life. Do you know what he said? That's nice. Took everything in his stride. There's a great tradition up there in Caister, Great Yarmouth and all those points of Norfolk of, of looking after people in trouble at sea. They have some nasty waters out there. Well, the waters are fine. It's the bits underneath it. The ground seems to come up too much. If you look at the scroby sands, which is if you're going down the Great Yarmouth seafront, you look out to the left, you can see it all bashing and crashing. And these boys uh, go out there. So to you boys from the Caister on Sea, Lifeboat and all the supporters, basically 250 alcoholics living in a shed on the beach. Uh, some money is coming your way. So don't forget, folks, if you want to help, donate. Double six, treble seven is what you do. Text donate, double six, treble seven. That's the first time I've got that right in a year. Anyway, I've been out on tour, as you know, and the Case of the Lifeboat boys have been following in my wake. Let's have a look at them. Tell us about the new boat, Rich. Oh, it's going to be incredible, Jim. Incredible. It's going to be a leap in technology that we probably, had, probably haven't had since 91. So, yeah, big, big changes for us. 14 metres, so old money, that's 45 foot. This is the biggest boat we've had on Case to Beach since we've been going, since 1794. So, yeah, it'll be good. 1.6 for the boat, another million for the tractor and trailer and some shed modifications so yeah we're up over the two and a half to three million quid how important is the public donations for you with this oh, it's huge that's it's huge it's, it's, it's what it's all about i mean all the money we raise in the organization is done from the shed the, the shed you see actually the footprint there's no other admins no other admin fees it's all done from the group of 30 40 volunteers and the support network around it so yeah it's massive it's huge that's a big thing it's such an important appeal for us to uh, to raise the money and anything anyone can do i mean there's been a difficult two years so about anything from a pound to ten pounds, as you know, from a penny, it all helps. So I think what we'd like to do is get as many people as you can just to know a little tiny bit so no one feels it's quite so much. So anything you can, thank you. Well, technology has changed. This makes rescue much more efficient. The crew being the dry, uh, have the speed and uh, the pulling power to do almost any job that we're, that we're after to do. When's the launch of the appeal, John? It'll be on Thursday the 24th of uh, March at 7.30 in the evening at the Yarm Great Yarmouth Town Hall. And uh, hopefully we'll have many people who raise money for us who will be taking part in that launch. But more importantly, uh, that'll give the people of Norfolk and the region an opportunity to say, see what we're trying to achieve. It'll be quite an emotional ride for me because I've still got two sons in the crew, Richard and Aaron. Back in 2018, we lost my wife, their mother, um, to, um, she had a massive heart attack and never recovered. And she always said about organ donation. So we said about, you know, different things. And then when it came to it, uh, they said they couldn't use our organs for whatever reason, because they didn't know what caused the heart attack, which was a big blow to, obviously to us from Annette's uh, that was what she wanted and um, so we decided or Richard decided that maybe she can help in another way if we can raise this money for this boat which is a large amount of money but we're going to do it with your help and the general public we are going to do it even if I have to sell the soles off my shoes to do it we're going to do it um, to get the name of Annette Thurl on the lifeboat so she would help somebody in some way because she couldn't supply her organs please please Donate whatever you can. The last penny, it, if you can only put a penny in the box, every penny, that penny might make up the total amount of what we need. Yeah, and they say there's some uh, new equipment being made uh, for the lifeboat. Is that right? A new helmet that the coxswain has to wear when he goes to see <laughs> yeah, it. And, and you're going to demonstrate it for us, Absolutely, aren't you? Dick, yeah. let's have a look, mate. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's the new fundraising scheme. This has sort of been, uh, I've been pressed ganged into this by John Candle and my own son. Thank you very much. And this is just a, a quick shot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you 
you know, I have to say that, but it looks like Percy. <laughs> yeah. You need these piers, aren't they? Because they don't go over the sea. <laughs> Do they? You know that? They sort of just they stop like that, and, it, and these were built by people from Caister on Sea. That's why. <laughs> why don't they go over the sea? We run out of wood. <laughs> Well, why didn't you start the sea and make your way back? Well, we might have been marooned. <laughs> he couldn't swim. Lifeboatman for 40 years and couldn't swim. And I actually said to him, Percy, you're a lifeboatman. Why can't you swim? He got me said, I've never had to swim. I've always had a boat. <laughs> Hi, Miles Crawford here. And I would like to personally thank you all for your donations to red, white and blue day. Uh, for those of you who do want to donate, just text DONATE to 66777. We'd really appreciate it. Good morning from Africa. <laughs> Scientists in Nigeria have found a transsexual elephant. It was thought that Nubu, a six-year-old African elephant, has spontaneously changed his sex. But further analysis proved that Nobu had in fact caught his cock on a fence as he ran off yelling. His cock stayed in the fence. <laughs> Medical help for elephants is scarce in Nigeria, so... Local SeaWorld exhibition sent for skin divers. <laughs> I wrote that one. <laughs> anyway, the penis was transferred to the Cock Hospital in Lagos for later auction. Several bids have already been made. One by Edwina Great Snatcher, who believes that her prayers had been answered <laughs> after her husband, while smoking something, sold his own cock to a white tourist for 300 pounds and a jet ski. <laughs> I bought this from the same person. <laughs> anyway, that's about 10 people around the table was having such fun. And then the birthday girl goes, oh, Miles. For my birthday, why don't you tell a joke? Oh. oh. I ate that, didn't you? Oh, my goodness. So, the joke I was going to tell, did you, you know, the joke about little fat pig? <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, I won't tell the whole joke. But um, what, what you do, what you, you tell this joke about this fat pig it's on a farm, you kick it and punch it, and you kick it and punch it every day. And then the punchline is the owner came up to me and said, Miles, one day that little fat pig is going to ask you to tell a joke. <laughs> Hello again, children. Sticky Vicky here. Welcome to Don't Watch With Mother. Here's a lovely old story that you've probably heard your grandmother singing while she was pissed. <laughs> Georgie Porgy Pudding and Pie kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Wessex police are looking for a portly man. Uh, his age is unknown, who was seen kissing girls and making them cry. This, of course, is a sexual offence, contrary to the Sex Offenders Act 2003. If anyone was in the area of Millbrook Estate on the night of the 7th, perhaps visiting Liddles. We will ask you to come forward, please. Were you one of the boys who came out to play that night? We want to know. The main suspect, reported as being Mr Porgy, was seen running away. Were you one of those boys who chased him that time? Mary Mary was quite contrary when she was asked how her garden was growing. She took this quite rightly as a question regarding the state of her pubic hair. <laughs> <laughs> Please, are looking for people to come forward if they recognise this person. Scientists in South Africa are warning about a new strain of COVID-19. 
COVID-20. It's being called the Essex Girl variant as it spreads easily <laughs> and is more transmittable than any other strain, including the wrist and back. What are you laughing at? <laughs> It is thought that the virus started in a place called Bilariki. It makes people sticky, said Professor Dickey. <laughs> I wrote that one. <laughs> All travel has been banned in the arc. There's been many disruptions, including sport, especially football cancellations in the Far Cup. The scientists in Africa have explained the symptoms. They are little yellow cartoons. Yeah, yeah. Woo -hoo. Dad, shut up. <laughs> they are little yellow cartoons. The Essex variant leaves people with big duck lips. How you put the auto cue? <laughs> with big duck lips. The skin goes orange and the eyelashes look like Chim tabs on a power boat. <laughs> I didn't write that one. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, Bill and Ben in the bath. And Bill said, Flap the pop. Flap the pop, the flap the pop. And Ben said, If that stinks, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Every year, I've lost my license, my driver's license, every year since 1978. <laughs> and I'm proud of this. Because I can walk into any court in this land without a brief for non thieving people without a solicitor. I just walk into court. They go, guilty. I go, thank you. <laughs> There's police everywhere, and they pick on us, especially the motorists. A long time ago, do you remember that saying? Big Brother is watching you. We thought, <laughs> oh, we went. <laughs> 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 We go to the shop and precinct. What do we see? Cameras. Zzz, 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 zzz. Motorways. Cameras. Zzz, 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 zzz. <laughs> Always picking on motorists. They never catch fucking bank robbers, do they? <laughs> There's always. It's, it's always, <laughs> when you walk, when you're going down the, down the motorway, people in showbiz only drive at night times. And we know what it's like, Pe the police pick on us, us motorists, and I'm a fast driver. <laughs> I was doing 160 down the motorway and I was upset this time I was caught by this copper on his fucking horse <laughs> the horse was that fast the boat so I won the grand fucking national so so the thing is <laughs> they never smile, policemen. Because when you're driving your car along the motorway, we all put a tape on. <laughs> and we all sing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was driving, <laughs> driving down the motorway, and policemen, when they nick you, they always put the cap on. You know you've been nicked once you put the cap on. <laughs> a 
and they walk towards your car, arrogant. <laughs> I always wait till they get halfway between my car and their car, then I piss off. This copper stopped me once and he spoke like Max Wall. <laughs> Frank, it's true. <laughs> you with me, remember? And he said to me, Is this your car? I said, Yeah. He says, Is it automatic? It's automatic. I said, But I've got to be here to fucking drive it. <laughs> he said, He said, Step outside your vehicle, please, in an orderly fashion, and follow me behind your vehicle, please. I went behind my car, I said, what's the problem? He said, no back light. I went, what? Oh, officer, sorry, oh no. Oh, officer, no. Oh no. Oh no, 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 oh no. He said, it's only a back light, son. I said, where's my caravan gone? Deceitful sometimes, you know. Especially when I, I mean, I, I was just thinking then. I was just, I, I do think. When, when, I, when I was just thinking then, I thought farting. Yes, farting. Why is it women never admit to fart? Men are proud of their farts. <laughs> when we're with our friends by the bar, we feel a fart coming on, and we go, shh. <laughs> and all our mates go, <laughs> and we go, Nice one, Harry. <laughs> That's why farts smell. So deaf people can enjoy them. <laughs> but women never admit to it because they're too crafty and sneaky. <laughs> women try sneaky things like Coughing at the same time. <laughs> Hello. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> you girls don't know what it's like for a man when he first meets you to fart in front of you for the first time. It takes courage. We pick you up at a discotheque and say to you, Would you like a lift home, my darling? And you go, Yes, please. Yes, please, yes. And it's a cold night. So we put the heater on and all the windows of the car, they're all closed. And we feel a fog coming on. And we go, oh, fuck me now. No. Oh, no. And our bum holes are like that. Oh, mm. Mm, mm, mm. It's chewing the car seat. Mm, 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 mm. 
we can't wait, so we pull the car up and get outside. We say, there's something rattling in the boot. <laughs> and we go behind the car and we go... Because when they do, they take over the house. Us lads start off with a big wardrobe from there <laughs> to here. And then the girls move in with one dress. Just bought one dress. I really like you. Isn't this a lovely place you live in? Yes, quite nice. Six months later, the whole fucking wardrobe is full of their stuff. I never let them in to the bathroom. And the first time you hear your woman fart, it's a shock to us lads. When women fart, us lads are shocked. We go, huh. We could be watching a great movie on the television. Just you and your girlfriend. And women always sit on the settees with their legs tucked underneath them. And the man sits in his armchair and we're watching a good film like Ghost starring Patrick Swayze. And don't women cry easy? Oh, my love, my darling, I have hungered for your touch. And Patrick Swayze is going to heaven in ghosts with them little silver balls. And the women start crying and they go, Don't go, Patrick. Don't go, she loves you, she loves you. Don't go, don't go. Please don't go. Us men cry as well, but we cry differently. We cry like... <coughs> and all of a sudden, in that direction, we hear the sound for the first time. That's all. That's all we hear. I'm here. <laughs> and those lads go. Ah! You farted then. And the woman goes. <laughs> Lads, do it in bed and shove your heads under the blankets. Hi, I'm Francine Lewis. Please text donate double six triple seven and make sure you give generously. Oh, I sure. I have a mate called Billy McLeod, who's a big scary jock, and he founded the brilliant Veterans in Actions charity. And what they do is described in the title of the charity, veterans that are in action. They build and repair cars and they take them off, not just cars, Land Rovers and God knows what, and they take them off on expeditions all over the world. They're a great bunch. Let's have a look at what they do. My name is Billy McLeod and I'm a Chief Operations Officer and founder of the charity Veterans in Action. Veterans in Action is an armed force charity that helps veterans and their families who have suffered the effects of war or who have found the transition to civilian life difficult. Focusing on the emotional and physical well-being of those involved to help them grow as an individual 
or as a family. Veterans in Action projects are based on the decades old studies of post-traumatic growth where initially veterans can participate in tried and tested projects and enable them to grow within a team of their peers and what is now their new mission at home, helping themselves by helping others. Veterans in Action Alive Centre is the charity HQ and is ideally set in a beautiful private estate seven miles from Andover on the Hampshire-Wiltshire border with beautiful walks through woodlands and the scenic Hampshire countryside. This environment helps to de-stress as soon as veterans enter the estate and veterans feel safe and relaxed in the quiet of the countryside. Veterans in Action use their own unique Alive programme, which takes a non-therapy, long-term approach to veterans' mental health, to help veterans and their families grow at their own pace through participation on the projects run at the Alive Centre, or off-site in the surrounding area, or on long-distance expeditions. Our off-road vehicles are also built off-site on a successful project called Veterans Expeditions Overland. The work is carried out at a local garage run by a Rumi veteran with a fantastic team that works alongside veterans teaching them practical skills. There you go, veterans in action. I knew that they were planning an expedition over to uh, the Ukrainian border to take vital aid, and, and Billy knows all about that. So I went down there and gave them a little advance check from, uh, from what we're gonna give them from this day, this red, white, and blue nose day. It was 3,000 pounds to enable them to top the tanks up and get over there. But as you see, nothing goes to plan ever. Right, so we were in the process of building this when this all kicked off. This is going to be a gym, our new gym in there. This is another extension for the workshop. At the moment it's a mess because we've got stuff everywhere. Let me show you in there. All of this stuff's all been donated, like from all over the country. Uh, a lot of local stuff. Uh, what we've made here, Jim, you've, you've worked with the military for a long time, mate. Yeah. You know we've always got a bag, the yeah, closet grab yeah, bag. Yeah. So the military always have a grab bag. What a grab bag does, all your essentials are in there. Yeah, quick move so, bag. So if the shit hits the fan, guess yeah. what? You grab your grab bag yeah, and you yeah. run with that because that's got all your documentation in, all the stuff you need to survive. Right, so I must stay in these. That's all clothes at the back there. We don't need clothes. And You're saying they don't need clothes, Billy? Boy. At, at this present time, they don't need clothes. The simple reason is they're coming across with a lot of their stuff. There will be a point in this crisis where clothes are going to be needed but it's not at this time. The main stuff they need is first aid, medical stuff for the hospitals and all of that. So we've got a lot here behind you there, Jim. Toothpaste, toothbrushes, so hygiene stuff, that's always needed. Nappies, we've got a load of nappies on, on the load for this time, but we're now setting up for our next load and the load after. Billy, tell us the difference between you saying that the refugees are getting a lot of aid, but the people in the Ukraine are the ones that need topping up. Is that correct? So the biggest thing is the refugees are coming across the border. They are very quickly looked after by the aid agencies on the border. Then they're transit transiting on to wherever they end up. Uh, people are taking them in in Germany and all over Europe. What's happening is it's the people that are left in Ukraine that are not are able to get the aid, that same aid. Our aim is to get, we've got Polish partners and Ukrainian partners working on this project with us. We get it to them then they transfer it into the cities so the cities are getting the aid that they need. Now that needs to happen more from other agencies. So we have to be careful in listening to what they want, which is medical aid. They are suffering, the, the hospitals aren't getting the aid. There's hospitals still filled with people, uh, 
young kids that are in now the basement or under car parks. They've set up a ICU and stuff like that in car parks. They need the aid of medical stuff. Now I know that NATO are supplying lots of aid and that will get in, but it's the, the normal people on the street that actually need the first aid equipment uh, for any of the injury they're receiving from all the bombing that's happening. Most of the donations that we've had so far are from individuals. Some businesses have donated, but what we need is the big medical companies to start uh, stepping up. I mean, I don't know if they are to the government, but we've not seen that. And uh, we'll be able to get the stuff right into Ukraine uh, immediately. Within a few days of being there, it'll be right in the places to go. So all the big companies like Bayer and all the other pharmaceutical companies, they need your help right now. They need you to kind of stop looking at profits and get the stuff to where it needs to be. Billy, it's... Uh Good luck, mate. I know you're going away tomorrow morning. Yeah. Uh, red, white, and blue nose days on the 18th. We're going to get as much as we possibly can, folks. This, this is how it. They're not called veterans in action for nothing. These are veterans, and they are in action. And here's a little uh, little check uh, from us. Uh, it, it's, it's a it's a little it's, it's, it's the wrong check. It's the wrong check, mate. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Here's a check, 50 quid from the STD clinic. With the thing saying it's all cleared up now, Billy. Thank you very much for that three thousand. <laughs> no, I made three thousand quid here. Like, uh, thanks to all the kind of viewers on Ustream. Without your help, we can't do what we do. So get on your red, white, and blue day, and that'll be fantastic. If you can help us out even more. That fifty pound will go a long way. <laughs> Fucking make this up! <laughs> How are they gonna get to Poland? I've no fucking idea. <laughs> Picture of him. He's, he's a celebrity. He's a celebrity. He is. Who's a celebrity? I'm down. <laughs> well, good luck. Keep your toes warm. Or they will be. Keep low. Move fast. Brilliant. Veterans in action, folks. Keep the money coming in. This is uh, the second one, I believe, Billy, second of track. many many trips. These guys never give in and they won't give in until the people of Ukraine uh, are helped as much as we can by British veterans. Fantastic. Here we are on our way to Poland and uh, stuck in a traffic jam just outside Antwerp. Uh, been up, nah, just roadworks. So like, uh, it's going to be a long day. Uh, how long have we been gone from now? We started at uh, we left at 2 o'clock this morning, I think. Yeah. What time are we on now, UK time? Uh, it's about, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon here or something like that. Uh, half one here. Half one here, so about half eleven. So we've gone about 10 hours, uh, nine, 9 hours, something like that. And we're going anywhere quick. <laughs> so we were hoping to get there by early tomorrow morning, but I think that's looking down. Here we are, it's uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. Just had a 24 hour drive to here. Me and Peter and the Polish uh, partners we got here, and we're loading this up. This one's going straight into Ukraine today. As soon as we load this up, it's off into Ukraine. So, there we go, and the rest of the vehicles are here, ready to get loaded up as well. There are the guys here. You can load all the medical supplies in there, we'll load what we want, another vehicle to load up. But there we go, there's a mini bus for Traffer Veterans fully loaded up. That's just going to be dropped off now into the inside, that'll go up on a different transport. Uh, separate the medical stuff from, because they'll go to different places. And there's a lot of uh, ladies stuff and nappies in there. Just finished that 24 hour drive, dropped the stuff up off this morning and our Polish partners gave us a little apartment stay in. So Duncan slept in there last night. I had the air bed in there. And Greg, I have to say, where is he? Where, where's Greg going to? Hello. Greg got the bed. Welcome. And then the other guys headed off to a hotel with them to head back, didn't they? Really? I had an air bed, it wasn't that comfortable, it was cold. Uh, it was freezing here last night, absolutely freezing. So, showers, toilets, all that, like, uh, I mean, the poles have been fantastic for us. Yeah, so that's us, we're heading for the border today, that's the plan. Here we are with Pietra. Uh, invited us around for breakfast this morning, innit? Thanks very much. 
Got a lovely spread here. Looking forward to this. There you go. Heading up towards the border, haven't we? Yeah, just waiting for the lights to get green. And we decided not go to, uh, not to use the motorways. So we'll get through all the small towns and cities in Poland. Heading for the border. So we'll see where we end up. It's been a bit, a bit of a hectic few days. Uh, we, we didn't manage to film much because we were driving all the time. We drove for 24 hours uh, to get to uh, Lignessa, uh, just over the Polish border from Germany, where we dropped the stuff off at Pieta. Uh, then two of the vehicles headed back to the UK. They are now back in the UK. Yesterday, we travelled up towards the Belarus-Polish-Ukraine border. We're about 100 miles, 140 miles away from there just now. And then we're going to head up there. Uh, this morning, just gonna have a bit of breakfast. Head up there this morning, and then we're going to start heading south to try and check out all the uh, border crossings to see what's going on. Uh, so that's our task for today. Yeah, we're just here, close to the border of uh, Belarus. Uh, Ukraine and Poland. I took a little back track. We don't, we don't want to go any further because uh, the border's just at the end of this track here. So we'll just come down and have a look. Let's just see if anything's happening. And then we're going to start heading south now uh, towards a place called Chelmo. Well, there's a border crossing there. And then we'll see what happens when we get there. So, oh no, it's really good. And great tracks here. If you can do any off road drive, there's lots and lots of tracks here. Right, we're just uh, through a town called Chell, it's about 15 miles behind us. Uh, we're heading towards the Ukrainian border, border crossing here. Uh, which is just in front of me now. Actually, let's take them in. Yeah. Yeah, here we are at the... Just at Border Reception Centre, and they've got a lot of st stalls set up uh, for people to get stuff as they come through. Uh, the Polish humanitarian service is behind us here, and lots of the refugees and, and family uh, waiting for other families to come through. Uh, just behind me, you can see lots of people waiting just to get their loved ones through the border. It's a pretty humbling experience, I have to say. Uh, there's places for eating. Uh, it's pretty cold here as well, so it's not the best thing for them. But everything seems to everything seems to be well organised. Traffic coming through from at Kiev. In front of me, Kiev is about 340 miles that way, or Kiev, should I say? And the town of Chelm, or city of Chelm, is 26 kilometres, or about 15 miles away, down that way. Uh, lots of people waiting here. Uh, for people to come through, you can just see some refugees coming through now. Uh, we don't want them in their faces. Uh, and you can see the humanitarian aid set up all the way along uh, to meet people and, and bring people through and give them something to drink, something to eat. So it's all pretty uh, well organised. And there's a fleet of taxis just up the road there where we're parked. Uh, and it's just ferrying people uh, probably back into the cities. We just, uh, just got to the first, we, we went up to uh, the border near a place called, was it Brest we went to this one? Yeah. Yeah, near Brest, uh, close to the, uh, the border of the three countries of uh, Belarus, Ukraine and Poland. We didn't go too far towards the border, for obvious reasons, we didn't want to get uh, caught in anything. Uh, we did a little bit of off-road route through to a, a little place where we could get a view on of it but, and, and that was alright so like uh, we've now come south from there uh, 
we've got Chelm, which is 15 miles just up the road there. And uh, just behind Greg there, where you've just seen us, is the border. Uh, it's, it's very humbling, isn't it, Greg? It's uh, incredibly humbling being there. Uh, there's a fleet of taxis, a lot of German taxis and our support vehicles, yeah. isn't there? Lots just of picking German. people up and probably taking them through to Germany now, I think. So there's a lot happening. Uh, all the relief agencies are there. Uh, they seem to be well stocked with supplies. Uh, baby stuff and all that and some of the people come across they're probably in their 90s like coming across and walking through the border there that's quite uh, really humbling to see like you know they, uh, they just gave up their lives to come through because of this some madman that's actually boils my piss if I'm honest like to see people like this but anyway we're going to head for the next border post now which is I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name because my Polish isn't the best <laughs> My English isn't the best, but my Polish isn't that good either. <laughs> so that's where we're off to now. We're near a place called Hussein. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. H-U-Y-S. H-U-S-Y-N-N-E. Here's Poland over here. And here's Ukraine. Two and a half miles from uh, Medica, and we've just had uh, news through that uh, <coughs> the Russians have done a missile attack about 36 miles from uh, Medica. So I'm expecting, uh, even if it's not busy today, Medica uh, will be very, very busy in the future of people leaving Lviv. Uh, just like uh, the war is getting very, very close to the Polish border now. And that's a worry for everybody here too. Away from America now, and there's a bit of a crisis going on there now, obviously because of the, what's happened at 36 miles away. So we're heading for the uh, refugee centre now, Presimo, I think that's what you call it. Uh, and see if there's, we can find out what's needed there, so we can pass that message back to the UK. So we're here at Bresnik and um, we've just uh, been to the train station where all the refugees are coming in. I have to say it's, it's very hard to get anywhere in to see what we can do to help because there's such a large police, police presence that have cordoned everything off and, and rightly so. Uh, we could be anybody just uh, wandering in so we get that completely. Uh, so this goes back to our original plan mode. Keep on working with Peter and uh, see what we can do to get the stuff into the Ukraine with him. Right, we've got about eight hours. We're heading back now. We've got about eight hours to get to uh, Dresden. We're going to stop for the night. So there's the film of them back now safe from the Ukrainian border. Uh, they're great guys, brave lads. And as I said, this is more about looking after veterans than it is uh, looking after the poor Ukrainians uh, that are suffering. Everyone suffers in war. The first thing, the first casualty of war is truth, isn't it? Eh? So Billy and the boys cut straight through that. Get out there, get that aid delivered where they can uh, deliver and well done them.
Send your donations in, folks. Text DONATE to 66777. Today we have got a man who is an icon and a British legend. He's touring the country helping men with mental health. Next we meet one of my favourite people. Coming up, we find out about the life, career and success of Frank Bruno here at Face to Face. A truly hard man. It's remarkable. I'm not, I used to be hard, I'm not hard no more. I'm a footy cat. <laughs> is it the investment of time? I mean, the, the thing about relationships yeah. is it, it can't be onerous one side. Yeah. You, you, you have to give. Yeah, 50, yeah definitely. 50. You've got to give and take. You know, so. Your first love really has been exercise, your boxing. business, and yeah. boxing, yeah. hasn't it? Could anybody ever compete with that? One of the most uh, unbelievable things to me about your foundation is that the NHS are now coming to you. There's some people, older people, what, need the medication and whatever, visit the hospital, they haven't got time because they're, they're blocked up, but there's a lot of nurses and people who know about that they can get people to come down to ours and have their injections or whatever. Can we have our next contestant, please? Your name? Donald J. Trump. And your chosen subject? Donald J. Trump. OK, Donald J. Trump. Your time starts now. A suit of cards ranking above the others in a particular hand is what? Trump. In a tarot card pack, any special suit of 22 cards depicting symbolic scenes is called a what? Trump. Surpassing something or someone by saying or doing something better is called what? Trump. Doing well is called coming up what? Trumps. In a court of law, when charges are invented, they are known as what? Trumped up. And now, the question that everybody's been waiting for. Breaking wind is called... A fart. <laughs> no, it's a trump. Oh, shit. No, it's a trump. No, I've just shit. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. I'm going to read you some nursery rhymes. Let's hope those horrid comedians don't interrupt. <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then I'll begin. <laughs> wait for us, wait for us. <laughs> oh, look at the tits on that. Oh, they're splendid, aren't they? Yes, they're doing lovely. George. It's Sticky Vicky. <laughs> Zippy, Zippy, why do they call her Sticky Vicky? I've no idea. Why do they call her Sticky Vicky, Bob? Because <laughs> she's got a rainbow over her knickers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Zippy. George, let me begin. Oh, yes, yes. Is it nursery rhymes? It's Sticky. nursery rhymes. Oh, yes, yes. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. When she bent over, Rover took over and gave her a bone of his own. <laughs> That's a rude thing to say. Thanks for that, I forgot. Yes, I know you did. You did. It was good to join in, you come to rehearsals. <laughs> May I do Little Miss Muffet? Oh, Little Miss Muffet. Oh, I love that one, Sticky. Do you know this one, Zippy? Yes, I do. Little Miss Muffet. Listen, boys. <laughs> Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. Her clothes were all tattered and torn. It wasn't the spider that sat down beside that her. Little Boy Blue with the old... <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> You read us another one. Carry on, Here carry on, Vicky. Do I don't think the viewer has noticed. All right, then. Here we go. One of my <laughs> favourites this time. The Grand Old Duke of York. Oh, I love that one. He yeah. had 10,000 men. Mm -hmm. And his case comes up next Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> so you keep doing, we doing each other's voices. <laughs> oh, I know, you're, you're fun. I'm zipping. Who are you? I don't know. Carry on, do another one. Do another one. I think you were going to do Diddle the Cat. Were you going to do your one, George? Oh, oh yes, I'll do my one. Go Thank on. you for reminding me. Yes. Here we go. Hey, Diddle Diddle. We the cat did a piddle all over the kitchen floor. Have a little dog laugh to see such fun and then pissed all over the cat. Oh, oh it! Oh, you <laughs> watch you bucked it up again. I've read the end line of the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what a cunt. Hang on, I forgot. <laughs> carry on, carry can on. We, can we get some help here? Have anyone seen Bungle? Oh, yes, I love Bungle. Bungle! 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 <laughs> Don't do that. 
I don't, I don't like Bunkle. But you don't I, like him, why not, Zippy? Because uh, he, he, uh, he was in the toilet and there was no toilet paper and he said, Zippy, the shit stick to your fur. I said, yes, it fucking does. And he wiped his ass with me. So, Bunkle, fuck, fuck off. off! Go and fuck off, you do you This is... Do I have to hold it? No, 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 no. Oh, right, okay. You don't have to do anything, right? right? You just, it's just going to happen. It, it's so clever, right? Right, right. And there you go. Yeah. Is, how's that for the camera? Is that not nice? Yeah. So, so Donald Trump. So good. So good. This is so good. I remember somebody said to me, somebody said, <laughs> now you don't have to talk. You don't, you're talking behind it. You huh? don't have to fucking. I didn't fucking talk. You don't have to do that. This does it all. You're spoiling it. Oh, I'll right, right. get it. Well, I'll yeah. try. I can't help it. And I'm impressed. <laughs> it you can't stop Jesus, this, man. So you where, do, where have you had that? Get... <laughs> <laughs> fucking hand me down, eh? It's the second, it's the second, some man summers. It's I'm a right. cunning lip linguist. It's a cunning lip linguist. Give us another linguist. voice, any impression, shout anyone you want. Uh, Chris Tarrant. <laughs> Well, here we go. I'll go out. Yeah, I'll do a great uh, Chris, uh, Chris Tarrant. You don't have to do anything. Oh, Stop said talking. It. Here Stop go. talking. Who Chris Tarrant. <laughs> Chris Tarrant. <laughs> ha ha, it's up to you. It's worth one million pounds. Getting this one right. Ha ha, teehee. It's up to you. Ha ha, teehee. How good is that, by the way? Go and see it there. And welcome to today's story. It was a lovely day in Dillydale. Mrs. Decency woke up and made breakfast for her husband, Mr. Swearword. Here we are, darling. I've made you some breakfast. Don't want it, poo bum, said Mr. Swearword. It's bacon and eggs and a nice cup of coffee. No thanks, you rotter, said Mr. Swearword. What on earth's up with him, thought Mrs. Decency. Normally, he'd say, shove it up your ass, you fat old cow. Something was wrong with Mr. Swearword. There was a knock at the door. Someone at the blooming door, cried Mr. Swearword. Well, said Mrs. Decency, whatever happened to piss off? We're not in. Mrs. Decency opened the door. It was her neighbour, Mrs. Fart. Hello, Mrs. Fart. <coughs> said Mrs. Fart. What a lovely day. I've just... <coughs> <laughs> made my husband's breakfast. <laughs> How is Mr. Big Nose? asked Mrs. Decency. Well, every time he breathes in, he's sick, said Mrs. Fart. <laughs> Can't think why. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Swearword, said Mrs. Fart. Good morning, Mrs. Emission of Wind, <laughs> said Mr. Swearword. Blimey, seeped Mrs. Fart. He normally calls me a shit-smelling slag bag. Something was definitely up with Mr. Swearword. Mr. Big Nose arrived with his best friend, Mr. Dyslexic. Poo, said Mr. Big Nose. Can you smell shit? I can't even spell me name, said Mr. Dyslexic. <laughs> We've been to see Mrs. Blowjob. Yes, said Mr. Dyslexic. She cooked my sock. Later in the afternoon, Mrs. Blowjob visited her Polish neighbour, Mr. Whack One Off. Mr. Whack One Off was whacking one off with his girlfriend, <laughs> Miss Bean Flicker. <laughs> Are you in? said Mrs. Blowjob. Just coming, they cried. The mayor of Dillydale, Mr. Big Knob, who was a big knob and had a big knob, <laughs> called a meeting in the town hall. The meeting started with Mrs. Blowjob giving Mr. Nobbs, Big Knob, a blowjob. <laughs> this is more than I can chew, she said. I'll help you, shouted Mr. Boy Band member. <laughs> I want a boob job, shouted Mrs. Droopy Tits. I want a poo, said Mr. Big Job. I want a job, said Mr. No Job. I don't, said Mr. Sasa. I've got a blowjob jobbing slurp, Mrs. Blowjob. <laughs> Mr. Death said nothing, nor did Mr. Dunn. Mr. Big Knob started the meeting. All is not well in Dillydale. I know, said Mrs. Decency. My husband won't swear anymore. I smell a rat, said Mr. Big Nose. That'll be my knob, said Mr. Dirty Knob. Mr. Dead said nothing, nor did Mr. Dunn. I want my husband to swear again. Why won't you swear, she cried. Why, why, why? Because I don't want to, said Mr. Swearword. The Mr. Men were open-mouthed. 
all except Mrs. Blowjob, of course. Right, said Mr. Dirty Knob, I'm going to wash my knob clean. <laughs> I'll learn to read, said Mr. Dyslexic. I'll get a job, said Mr. No Job. I'll have a shit, said Mr. B Big Job. <laughs> Job, said Mrs. Blowjob. I'll get a nose job, said Mr. Big Nose. I'll put a bra on, said Mrs. Droopy Tits. No more strikes, said Mr. Scouser. I can hear, said Mr. Death. I'll buy a rabbit, said Mrs. Decency, and I'll shove a cork up my arse, said Mrs. Fart. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Swearwood laughed at all the grief he had caused. What a load of stupid fuckers, he said to himself. And they all lived happily ever after. Um, this was in uh, 2018, just before the pandemic kicked in into 2019-20. Uh, I went to Africa, South Africa. Um, I was going to go with Miles, but he's racist. So I went on my own. <laughs> and, and while I was there, while I was there, I met one of Miles' very close friends, believe it or not, called Desmond Tutu. And Desmond Tutu said to me, he said, why don't you come, he said, and do a concert and raise some money for the orphans of South Africa. I said, of course, I have pleasure, I'll do that. So we did, and we raised two million pounds. And he said, how can I repay you? You know, I said, um, I said just 10%. And uh, he said, I'll tell you what. <laughs> he said, I'll do one better. And he took me on a safari. And we went on a safari, and we were holding hands. He was praying to God like, Allah, Allah. No, no, he was praying to God his way. And we went through, um, and it was lovely. And we spent some time together. And one night, very dark, no moon, windy, raining. And, um, and basically, I slipped on the side of the uh, hill, and I went straight down. I was like, Desmond! And he was like, Kew! you know. And I was, in, I was in safari on my own for three days. And finally came across an opening, a village far away from civilization, about 20, 25 people, very tall, skull spears jumping up and down. And I spent three days with them because they tied me up. <laughs> and the chief, the chief, uh, who was standing in front of me for two days, he wouldn't blink on one leg. And he said to me, he said, Kev, how he knew my name, I don't know. But he said, Kev, <laughs> he said, I'm going to teach you a traditional African love song. So wherever you go in the world, if you sing this, the woman, she will fall in love with you. So today I'm going to play that piece of music for our wonderful Vicky. Uh, and I hope she enjoys it very much. This is a traditional African love song for Vicky. Word. You I can went. say any Let English word. Tell any me English me word. Let me Let me stop tell it. Stop you. it. I know every English word. <laughs> word. What's a word? <laughs> it's like a turd. Laugh with a nail. It's, it, it's very English. I get very educated in English, of course. <laughs> any word. You tell me any word. I can say. I give you a word. Okay. Yeah. And if you can say this, if you can say this, oh, yeah. okay. then what we'll do. <laughs> is we will stop this nonsense. We will bring peace to the world. I, I like if that. If you can say this word. Any word you like. Only if you can say it. <laughs> the word I want you to say, Kim, the Rocket Man. Yeah, Rocket Man. The Rocket Man is squirrel. 
와? 아? The word. What? 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 <웃음> the word I want you to say <웃음> is squirrel. Ah, p a c e up, a c e Squirrel. I'm not quite. No, no. Try again. Squirrel. <웃음> squirrel. No. Squirrel. No. The word you have to say. Yeah. So true. Break it down. Break mm-hmm. it down. I will break the word down. Break for it you. down. Square. Square. <laughs> square. <laughs> real. Oh, I got it. I got it. Just <laughs> pick Mr. d a b o n o s Um, square. Real. Oh, 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 oh. Real. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. s i t <laughs> oh God! You make me so terrible. I got a I got a ladies and I gentlemen. Got a, ladies and gentlemen. I got a call for we. I got a call for we. Whoa, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Osmond and Kim Jong Un and Bobby d a v r o Okay. Bye, everybody. I got to get a tissue. <laughs> Tell me some letters about this. Okay. Well, hello. <laughs> it's such a great h o n o r to have been asked to do this slot on this lovely p r o g r a m and it's my pleasure to be here to help you with all your problems. Um, I've been going through the many letters that I've received, and I've decided to go with this one. So here we go. It says, "Dear Auntie Vicky, I'm starting to v- develop feelings for our gardener." She has been a gardener for a number of years, but yesterday I watched her pulling up some beetroot, and I got a tingling feeling in my nether regions. Well, I'm a straight woman, and I've never had lesbian tendencies. What should I do? Right. Now I've thought about this answer, obviously, and to be honest with you, I think you should stop eating beetroot. Be a good start. You know what I mean. Have you mentioned though your feelings to the gardener, or in fact to your husband? Maybe try telling your husband first. Tell him when you get into bed with him, and, and then you could see if he has a, a little twinge or something. You know. Talk to him about having an affair with the gardener. See if it turns him on. I mean, it might be a way of of releasing your pent up sexual urges. Think about that one. If, however, he throws you out the bed and calls you a dirty rug muncher, you might have to adopt Plan B. <laughs> Next time your gardener is pulling up some turnips, why don't you bend down next to her and maybe whisper uh, that, that you love the way she handles your turnips and and just see if she reacts. You know, it'd be prudent. I, I wouldn't hide all the forks and rakes, though. I would hide them, you know, because you might get a negative reaction. And I must tell you that I had an affair with my gardener once, so I do relate. Um, he was 86. Um, I took pity on him, <laughs> and I decided that I'd have my way with him. Uh, well, uh, my my husband was playing golf at the time. He never knew what hit him. The poor old sod. <laughs> anyway, I hope that's helped. It was a lovely funeral, by the way. Oh. Excuse us, mate. You couldn't tell us where the toilets are, could you, please? Are you new here? Oh, I am. I am. Yeah. If you're new here, you won't know. Uh, won't know what? The toilet's been broken for months. We just stand at the edge of the balcony and piss off the top. Oh no, mate. I, I couldn't do that. I, uh, uh, excuse us. <laughs> you couldn't tell us where the toilets are, could you, please? You're new here. Uh, I am. Yeah. Listen, just go to the edge of the balcony and do it over there. Pleasure, Jim. I, I, I now have to touch my ball, and I have to look and get the feeling. When I get the feeling, the pictures become clear. 
They are clear, I see. She may see beautiful women. Many women. Many beautiful women. Oh, I see the ex-wives. Oh. I see ex-wives. I see an ex-wife. Wife number one, ex-wife number one. No. Ex-wife number two. No, Jim. Uh, ex-wife number three. Jim. Four. No, no, Jim. It is number five. But she's not an ex-wife. Oh, shit. Would you like a sweet? Oh, yes, please. Oh, so, God, yeah, what? copycats, that was the start of it, I suppose, for me, wasn't it? You know, with Hilary O'Neill, Alan Stewart, yeah. uh, Bobby, Bobby Davro. Bobby was in the first one, yeah. which, of course, Danny does a fantastic Davro. And Davro, screw you! Yeah. <laughs> dreadful, fucking <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> That's the thing about you, because you do the impressions that we do, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you do, you do. <laughs> no, I don't do them on stage, a bit. <laughs> yes, you do. No, no, no. You do, you do no. my... You do my Frank Bruno, whole act now. How come he's no, your Frank Bruno? Well, well, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no hang on a minute. I lines. turned into Luga Booga 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 Booga. Your line, my right. arm. <laughs> Laurel and Hardy wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can only do impressions of other people doing impressions. Yeah. I can only do impressions of impressionists. And Dan, Dan <laughs> I should be Bobby Davro, really. <laughs> But, da but Danny, will tell you, Danny will tell you, if another impressionist does... Uh, so if you... Rory Bremner, if Rory Bremner did a... I don't know, let's say Jeremy Clarkson or something, it's easy to do. It's yeah. easy to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. I, I, Danny might have the explanation, but when you hear another person, another impressionist, mm. proper impressionist, not, not an imposter, a proper impressionist, <laughs> do it. It's easy. But but saying that, Jim, saying that, still, my favourite impression that you do is Sir Alex Ferguson. That's the only reason I've come on this show, so I can watch you do that. Well, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I, yeah, well, there's a fantastic film about him yeah. on, uh, on the Tebber, baby. <laughs> a film. Film. Uh, one day the come, It comes with Govan uh, and Glasgow. Glasgow. And he can't say hell. And he can't say, well, baby. <laughs> and he certainly cannot say, well, she baby in with, uh, with a roof rack. And uh, L's and R's, he's fucking yeah. at it. And he chews gum and he's got, he doesn't move, uh, move her lips. Uh, but he's a great man. And the other yeah, thing is, he's, 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 brilliant, got, brilliant, he's got a great brilliant. sense of humour, which people don't realise. Oh, he's really brilliant, 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 brilliant. <laughs> and he went, 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 <laughs> oh, a wump. A wump. A wump. On his wag. <laughs> <laughs> on his wag. A wump on the wag. <laughs> and of course, he 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 had a cup of tea. <laughs> 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 Oh dear. Right, had some very nice reactions to my um, my help last week with that dear lady, but she hasn't been in touch with me yet to let me know what the situation is. But I've been going through yours today and I found this one here, which I must share with you. Um, it says, Dear Auntie Vicky, last night after I got out of the bath, I bent down to pick up the knickers I'd just taken off. Suddenly, without warning, a great dame leapt upon me and tried to have his way with me. Have a problem with that. It was quite a struggle. Eventually, he got tired of trying unpreferred biscuit. <laughs> I'm not laughing, it's not amusing, really. I end up being quite battered and bruised. I don't want to have him put down, but what should I do if he does it again? And that's uh, Sally from Surbiton. Hello, Sally. The first thing to do, I think, to avoid being injured is to take your dog immediately to the vets and get his bloody claws trimmed. Kermit's cock. Fuck the cooker up. Kiwi, kiwi, we squeal. A blunt knife is a dangerous knife. 
and a butt plug. I don't know what that is for. But by the time you've been drinking, waiting for it to cook, you're not fucking hungry. I'll show you how to do it. And here we go. <sighs> Cheers, by the way. Ooh. This is the wash. This is called the anal intruder. There's enough mashed potato here to feed an army. This is for all my gay friends <laughs> who know about cottaging. Look at that! Smells good, doesn't it, eh? Fucking stupid chicken. Chicken tikka masala. Yes. Ooh, chicken. Uh. Sensational. Ah! Fuck! Oh, God. Careful, dear. Hi everybody, it's me again, Ozzy. Oh, Ozzy. Oh, oh, oh. Sharon! Sharon! Uh, I fast got lumps in. No! Oh, I think I've shit myself. Oh. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's me, Donald J. Trump. What does the J stand for? Genius, genius, yes, genius. You know, folks, it's going to be here on red, white, blue, green, yellow, whatever it is, it's fantastic. Because you know what we gotta do? We gotta donate, we gotta donate, and it's easy to do, okay? All you do to donate, donate to red, white, and blue, nose day, you gotta donate double six, triple seven. You get it? Double six, triple seven. That's all you gotta do, fantastic. Years ago, I founded a charity called Care After Combat. It was me, Smokey Cole, Goose, don't ask, and Simon Weston. We decided that we would try and look after veterans in the criminal justice system, basically veterans that are in prison. Out of a prison population of 80 odd thousand, which moves around as you can imagine, some in, some out. We have about 4,000 veterans in and out of prison for various reasons. Now, I'm probably the same as everybody else. If you do the crime, you do the time. But the idea is, is to persuade someone while they're in prison not to do that crime again. Reducing, reoffending. what Care After Combat do brilliantly. They work by taking volunteer mentors who work alongside the veteran in the prison and outside of the prison to give him a hand up. As I say, not a handout, a hand up. But one evening when, uh, oh God, I had a young soldier attempting to take his own life on the telephone to me, watching Match of the Day actually, and trying my best to get this guy not to kill himself. And, and we did, me and, me and the missus and Doc Murdoch, we managed to find out where he was, got the police around there. They took him to hospital and saved his life, only for two days later that he checked out of hospital and took his own life. He was on a, on a mission. And no matter what we did, we couldn't deter him from that mission. So it proved one thing to me, that peer mentoring alone is not enough. So just before I left the charity, uh, they had set up, or we set up, the most wonderful deal with the NHS. The NHS are now providing staff and expertise, and Care After Combat are working alongside the brilliant NHS, who are there for everybody including the veterans in the criminal justice system. Without the NHS's help and guidance uh, through Dr. Jane Jones up there in Newark, alongside Adrian Kirk. He was a commander in the Navy and left just before he became Captain Kirk. Wise move, Adrian. So together, the NHS and Care After Combat and other charities that bolt on and work together in a cluster to stop our young servicemen and women reoffending, They're doing a brilliant job. Let's have a look at a little animation that was made by veterans in prison. And this is someone's story, and you're gonna hear that someone afterwards. So please, let's think about this and try and donate, try and help. I left the army in 1992 with an exemplary service record of 14 years. I've been out longer now than I was in. But over the last years, not a day has gone by when I haven't thought about my time in the army.
In August 1976, I arrived at Northampton for basic training, and for 18 weeks we were thrown together, isolated from the outside world, screamed and shouted at. Kept busy, exhausted, and always in a position where we had to work together as a group. With hindsight, I suppose I can look back and see that this was part of the brainwashing necessary to create a fighting machine. But at the time, all I knew was that this was what I'd been born for. My first posting was a cushy number in Gibraltar, which was great. Next, it was Northern Ireland on a five-month emergency tour. That wasn't great. I was terrified. I had postings and detachments all over the world, from Germany to the Falklands, but I always seemed to end up back in Northern Ireland. Eventually, you can't live in a constant state of terror, so it's like your mind switches off and you don't give a shit anymore. You accept it, you stop worrying, you distance yourself with a dark sense of humour, diluting the terror with laughter. At like the time I was escorting engineers in sniper country, Four Kill, South Amar. And because of the drilling, we hadn't heard a sniper shooting at us. A panic-stricken bloke ran to tell us, and I'll never forget the look on his face when we all just cracked up laughing. R&R &R seem to make things harder. The real world becomes an alien world, full of civvies who don't have a clue. So you drink, and you fight, and then you go back on duty, where you know where you stand. I spent two years as the Brigadier's sandbag in Londonderry. Two years putting myself in a position where they'd have to kill me, not the Brigadier. And I never questioned it. It was just a laugh, really. You don't question it in the army, you just get on with it. You do what you're told. So I suppose I knew my time in the army was coming to an end in 1988. Two days before Christmas, when I finally did start questioning it. On duty at the Mays Prison. Watching in disbelief as they let the prisoners out for a holiday. My wife was six months pregnant at the time. I'd have quite liked a Christmas holiday myself. At the end of yet another posting in Northern Ireland, this time for three years, I'd had enough and I decided my army days were over. I bottled out my own leaving do and flew out of Belfast City Airport, feeling like it was the last days of my life. Gutted. But something changed inside me on that flight, and by the time we landed in Manchester, my spirits had lifted. I felt set free and positive about my future as a civilian, and it seemed quite like my feeling was spot on when I breezed straight into a job. How wrong was I? This first job turned out to be a cold lesson on the difference between being a soldier and being a civilian at work. I was used to orders, and getting on with the task as quickly as possible to the best of my ability. And while this is appreciated by your colleagues in the army, it's not appreciated by your colleagues in a factory. Not when management start to wonder why everyone can't graft as hard as you. So I was called a blackleg. I was alienated, but I didn't get it. I thought the people upstairs were supposed to be in charge. I thought we were supposed to do what they told us. I thought wrong. I walked out and got a job as an insurance investigator, which meant frequent trips between Manchester and London. I started taking detours off the M40 on these London trips to my old camp at Bicester to see my mates. And these detours became what I lived for a brief respite in the nightmare world of Sibby Street. Eventually, of course, my mates had less and less time for me each time I stopped off. After all, they had their own lives to live as soldiers. I felt more and more isolated, but I couldn't stop these detours, if only if it was to drive past the camp. On one occasion, I actually went into the mess, gave my old number and ordered a meal, just to be back in a world where I could breathe. Back in Manchester, my life was starting to get out of control. I was drinking heavily, cheating on my wife, 
and sparking off meaningless fights with groups of lads just to get myself a kick in. I knew my life was like a plane falling out of the sky, but I didn't really know how to stop it crashing and I definitely didn't know how to ask for help. By Christmas 1995, I'd had enough of my job. I dumped the company car at Cardiff, hitched home, and ended up in a row with my wife, which turned violent. The only reason I didn't kill her, or myself, or both of us, was my two sons. Within a year of that night, I'd been locked up for life. In a way, it was a relief. Why? I don't blame the army for my offence. That was down to me. And who knows, maybe I was destined to end up in prison. And maybe it was only the army that kept me out of serious trouble for the 14 years I was a soldier. The army turned me into a soldier, but the things that made me a good soldier made me a bad civilian. And that's probably true of a lot of veterans. When I was a soldier, the army was the making of me. When I became a civilian, the army was the breaking of me. I don't know how to be a civilian anymore. Now I'm in prison, it's like I'm back in the army with the rules and structure and the regime and they're getting told what to do, and when to do it. Maybe that's the only way I can actually live now. It's my story. It's, um, I wrote it whilst I was inside. Um, it was a governor, um, ex-RAF, who took me to one side and he said, he, we, we chatted about my army career and what I was inside for and that, and I told him how I was feeling every day and how I was waking up. And he said, you need to write it down, you need to write how you feel. So one day I sat down, well, it took me more than one day, but I started writing and I haven't stopped. I write little stories now about how I feel and some of them are funny. It's not all about doom and gloom. But that one story is about when I left, and I didn't feel like I was part of anything. Um, like it says in the story about me driving into the army camp, just to be part of that again. Um, and when you leave the forces, you don't feel like you fit in anywhere. You don't seem to have anything in common with anybody. You, you feel like you speak a different language. Um, that turns to drink, in my case. Um, drink. Um, not really showing much emotion to, to people, keeping everything bottled up inside. That man syndrome where, you know, you don't show your feelings. I suppose you, um, that's enhanced being an ex-soldier. And things were just bottling up and bottling up. And things were getting way out of control. Until one Christmas Eve I decided that I'd had enough and I was going to take my life. You know, that's what the charity is about. Um, uh, you know, engaging these guys, enabling them to make, you know, decisions that improve their lives uh, for the better. That's ultimately what we're about. And, and you've heard first hand there about uh, some, good, uh, some good results. Um, we were wrapping presents up Christmas Eve. We were having a little drink while we were doing it. Nobody was drunk, was, you know, not a lot of drink. And I realised it was drink that was causing this problem, so I poured everything away in the house. We give an offer of two years commitment, uh, i.e. 12 months before release from prison and 12 months after. But that's just a, that's a nominal, uh, you know, time period. We've worked with people way beyond the 12 months post-release. If we need to stay with them, we stay with them. Um, and that's, that's the way we work. And I walked out of the house, I sat in the canal, and I must have been sat there about an hour. It was um, really cold, wet, and I sat there, I thought, if I jump in the water, I climb out again, I just die of hypothermia, I just go to sleep, I won't wake up again. But then I kept seeing my children's faces, waking up in the morning, and there's a policeman at the door. Um, so I couldn't do it. Then Kara after combat came along, and I went on one of the first meetings and I didn't really say much. Just listened to what was going on, give a little bit of input and then left. And I went to the next meeting and I realised what it was about. It wasn't about what they can give us material wise. It was about the advice they can give us. It was about talking as a group. Everyone's like minded. We've all been in a situation that's got us there. And Curve to Combat was there willing to give us advice, 
and help us move on from that when we leave prison. And that's what they've done for me and I've stayed with them ever since. I can't ask more of them. Thank you all for supporting Care After Combat. It means a huge amount to us and obviously to the veterans we support. So please give what you can and I thank you in advance. Well, ladies and gentlemen, very good. Uh, let's keep those donations coming. We've really got to do well. How much is the BBC going to get? Far too much. Let's see if we can send a big message that some people in our country believe in our country. And our country is full of all different races and colours and creeds. Why would you want to look elsewhere when you've got all the world living here and all of us need a hand up? Not particularly a hand out, but a bit of a hand up occasionally. Here's someone that's had his hand up a few things. <laughs> oh, all sooty. <laughs> yes, it's the irreparable. It's Irreplaceable. Yes, the sensational. Irritable. <laughs> it's even tax deductible. <laughs> Robert Nankerville. I like that, Robert. Yeah, not many people call me Robert now. James Cameron. Yes. Your mother used to call you Robert when she told you off, didn't yes, she? Yes, she used to. I love my mum. I always remember her coming out the back door. Whenever I got hurt, and I've done this, I think I might have mentioned this before on your show, that when she used to come out, I can see her now, I'll get a bit choked up when I think of her, and she used to have a little black, white, spotty dress she used to wear in the summer, and yes. I used to get upset or something, I was crying in the back garden, scared of spiders on him, terrified. And whenever I got hurt or whatever it is, she used to come out and go, turn that frown upside down, she used to say. And then she used to come over, and I don't know if your mum ever used to do this, she used to get a little anky out, she used to keep it in her pocket. She used to spit on it. She used to, like used to wipe, wipe my little face like that. She used to always doing that, wiping my mouth. My wife does it to me now. Does when we're in the restaurant. <laughs> when she you gets eat a napkin food. and does that. Does she? Yeah, is that I horrible, mean, isn't it? I have a fucking crumb. <laughs> I'm little crumb there. They're eating something, the crumbs. Uh, I'm going to finish chewing this bit of steak first. Oh, it's funny. It brings back a lot of memories, that. She used to go that. They she used to... <laughs> when, was your... <laughs> <laughs> when was your mother born? Um... I don't know. I think she was a Woking girl. No, when? A oh, when? Yeah. God, now you're asking in the 40s? Yeah. <coughs> yeah my mum was 1919. My dad was oh. 1910. That's, yeah, how old was he when he passed? Uh, 27. <laughs> 27? <laughs> no, I don't. I think, I think he was 89. I think was he it? was 89 or 79. I can't remember. All I know is you look back and think, will that do me? God, blimey, I'd like to make 65. I had a brother going 61. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it was a terrible year, that. The Beatles were number yeah. one. <laughs> How old are you now? I'm pushing 60. Mm. Pushing it. Yeah. I'm dragging it. Yeah, I'm yeah, 64 yeah. this year. Oh, yeah? Will you still love me? Will you still need me? Mm, I might do. Mm -hmm. We could rent a cottage we in could. the Isle of Wight. <laughs> I like the sound of that. If it's not too dear. Not, not too dear. We'll have to... <laughs> Skimp and save. We will, indeed. Well, don't skimp and save tonight, folks. Here's Bobby Davro uh, in the flesh. In the flesh. He, well, I'm actually wearing a jacket. And I'm drinking a beer as well. Yes, this is lovely. Yes. I don't want you to think I'm an alcoholic. I want you to know I am. But I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not going to advertise this beer. Tell it, what's that thing you got in your pocket, the sniffy thing as well? Oh, there? that's me Vic Sinex, because I've had a bit of a... I haven't had the Covid. No. But I've had a bit of a blocked up nose. Yeah. Don't, not for the reasons you might think, because I don't... I did try that stuff, but I didn't like it. Mm. I like the smell of it. Boom, Ooh, boom, 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 gag alert. It's my Vic Sinex. Why do you stick in the Well, it's a, a, it's a su suppository, actually, for all the goodies. I might as well stuck it up me now, up me arse. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't even get that <laughs> right. couldn't even get that right. It's too late in the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Keep the money coming in. Keep it coming in. You know Alex Belfield, don't you? The ginger one, he that should be obeyed. The voice of reason. Anyway, we're about to launch the Alex Belfield season here on Ustream. And in April... He has eight shows, a series of the first series of eight shows, where he's going face to face with people. He went face to face with this guy. It's not fair, is it, the business? I, I started uh, 1997, 98, and a guy said two things to me which was profound. Firstly, they'll forget your name before you've even left the car park, which is mm. mostly true. And secondly... Not if you're on the top of the bill. Well, even then, you can quickly be replaced. Um, and, and it's not fair. The li whether you, you, nowhere is it written in the great libraries of Milan, Paris or New York, life is fair. I wonder whether you feel you should have been given more breaks than you got, because your talent deserves it. Yeah. But why aren't you Bradley today? Do you go there or do you try and... No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't worry me. I'm pleased for him. I'm not pleased for myself because I always believed that I would be taking over from Bruce or, or Dez. 
uh, and there's a Connor and people like that. I thought I'd been the new person that came up. I hosted a couple of um, children's shows, Run the Risk and stuff, and I did a, a game show for, God, we did about 70, 70 episodes of um, Winner Takes All, which I took over from Jimmy Tarbutt back yeah. then. And yes, I thought I was going to get a lot more uh, opportunities to do that. And then there was a new wave of comedy that came in. It was the Friday Night Lives. It was the mm. Saturday Night Lives. The, the, you know, the, the Dawn French and the, the Jennifer Saunders and the Harry Enfields. And there is a, there's a, sel a shelf life. And I, it sort of, we got moved aside. And uh, even Brian, who was sort of riding high at London Weekend, he, he, he got moved aside. I, I don't know why, but Anton Deck came along. And now I think which is what is I get frustrated at is the fact that you don't get, uh, I'm not on the list anymore. I used to be on the list. Well, if Brian can't do it or Bradley can't do it, maybe Bobby Davro and we need someone from them. And they don't come anymore because I'm not on the list. Mm. It's all the new people. And to be honest with you, we should, they should sort of make it um, a little bit more, you know, available. Mm. It's when I watch Britain Got, Got Talent and a dog wins it, a three-legged dog or something. What can you do with a three-legged dog? But it's not even a competition. I mean, I, I talk a lot about how they ask people to be on it. In fact, we had Francine Lewis in the chair. Um, she was asked to do it. I've got two mates this season who have been asked to do it. They're given a dressing room. It's not a competition anymore. No, it's because about the programme. It's, yeah. yeah, it's about the diversity in it as well. Oh, you know, I'm doing this for my, my granddad. He's got a wooden leg and a, a prolapsed arsehole. I've got to do it for him. <laughs> a collapsed arsehole? Yes, a prolapse. A prolapse? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll show you what, 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 <laughs> one, what no. it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a programme called The Games and they did, I just, it was weightlifted and they had me on it and then they, someone had clipped this in and I picked it up and I got it there and I went, <laughs> and as I pushed it up, I was watching this with my young kids, this is when they were younger then, I got on like this, you know, <laughs> as I've done that, it cuts to a picture of a prolapse. <laughs> 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 Never a true word spoken. Well, there you go. You mentioned Brian Connolly earlier, who I adore with the Pasquales and all that. And mm. Brian has been quite open about his struggles with, yeah. with just keeping the energy to be him. Like, you have to be you. You have to be Bobby Davro. Um, during those times when you're down, how do you get yourself out of it? Because uh, there'll be a lot of people watching now. And, and you know, we, we've got guests on this series, Frank Bruno being... Uh, the most spectacular yeah, of a man yeah. who has been sectioned five times. Yeah, he struggles, you uh, know. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, you know yeah. But that's interesting, isn't it? What do we know him for? His laugh. Whereas inside, he's often not laughing. Mm. And that's so profound, isn't it? That a man who is renowned for, for cheering people up, an icon and a hero, and the strongest man, is actually one of the weakest it went at his lowest. Um, how do you pull yourself out of it? How do you get back? Um... I think Dr. Footlights is the thing for me. I can be really unhappy, but when I go out and do a show, I, I, it all goes out the window because it's the only time I'm not, you know, I'm not being miserable. I've got to go out there. I've got to tell jokes. I've got to be funny. I've got to have fun. And I think that that, you know, my lowest times when I've been, you know, having heartache or something, I go home and I'll cry. All the way, if I'm leaving home, I cry sometimes to the to the venue. I get my jacket and my suit on, out I go, and I, I do better shows then. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like under diversity, I like that. And then I get back in the dressing room, and then I get back in the car, and then I start to cry again. It's but it breaks my heart that that, that happened or could happen again, because yes. it's almost pointless, isn't it? It doesn't achieve anything. You go on stage and do your show and then you torture yourself when you come off. How do you break that pattern? How do you stop that? It, you, the only way you can do it is through, uh, it's through, um, you've got to forgive whoever has hurt you, you have to forgive mm. them. Uh, because if you hold on to the resentment and bitterness, that's the thing that destroys you. It's like jealousy. Mm. Envy only hurts the envious, not yeah. the envied. And it is very difficult to do that. Very, very difficult. And then you, I tend to find it easier to forgive people that have hurt me, um, but I don't forgive myself, and that's mm. the battle I have. I find that, you know, because it's often because of what I've done that um, I, I'm, or they perceive I've done or whatever yeah. it is, and, they, and it hurts me when they, uh, but I, if you can forgive and not carry that resentment and look at things in a positive way, it's not easy, life, but there's a lot of other people out there a lot mm. worse off than likes of me. There you go. I Bob. hope you noticed in that clip there, yeah. right, 
I looked a bit peaky white. I wasn't very well that day. I wasn't Weren't very you? well at all. I looked like a scrotum with eyelashes, didn't I? I had that mm. face white, and now I've put a bit of makeup on. I look a bit. I put me. I put my makeup Your on. Your foot was going. I know. It, I'm a bit nervy. I'm always a bit nervy. Mm. Quite a nervous sort of guy, mm. you know. I was like shell shock for me Rice Krispies in the morning. Is that what it is? Yeah. Snack crackle and Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ! I've shit myself, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it. I met I've met Sharon a couple of times. Very nice, but I've never met Ozzy. I wonder if he'd like it. I'm, I'm a bit of a piss taker, really. And no, I, he would like it. He would uh, stop jumping the the taking over the interview here. Oh, sorry. How, what was it like <laughs> sit, sitting there talking about serious things? You're never really serious for long enough, are you? So how was it with Alex? Uh, I can't recall it very well. I just I just saw the clip there, and I just looked. I didn't look very well. I was. Mm. I think I was a bit picky. He going down with something. I don't know what it was <laughs> going down with uh, with Alice. Is that the word? The things he's been down oh, on. It's dreadful, well, ladies and gentlemen. Dreadful, oh. dreadful. That's my catchphrase. Now, you, <laughs> dreadful. You've dreadful. been entertaining the troops, and I thought you I know a few veterans. Tell them about your time in the Omar and the disaster that nearly went on. Well, there. it was actually pretty bad because we went over there. Uh, it was the day I think it was when Beckham scored that free kick. That took us either through to the finals of the Euros or the finals of the World Cup. Yeah. Against uh, Turkey or something like that. Mm. And all the soldiers, they built a stage out in the middle of the desert. So, so, so you're in the Oman, and it's been just Oman. prior to the Second Gulf War, wasn't it? It was. It was their warm up. I think it, must it have was been. afterwards, to be truthful with you. Was it? I, I thought it was, it was the getting ready. Who was that with Steps? It was with Steps and Ginger. Jerry Jim, Alliwell. Jim, Jerry, yeah, Ginger. This is Formula One. Alliwell. Sorry? Yeah. Mrs. Formula One. This that was, was just before Gulf War II. That was. Yes, OK, so it was, mm. yeah. And we went out and we did lots of grip and grins, went on a nuclear submarine. But the, the thing that was tragic, that night when Beckham scored the free kick, everyone, it was like that you could feel all these soldiers and they were all sitting well, in the Were they camp. watching it? They were watching it because it wasn't on the screen, it's on the stage. So we waited for the football to finish. When he knocked that ball in, everyone, wow, and they all came over. And it was like, a, it was like the, the old the days. Soldier, what about the Scottish soldiers? Was there any? No, they were stayed behind, they were gutted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, buzz out, baby. <laughs> and um, they all came over, and then, and unfortunately, someone got killed. Someone got squashed. It was a bit of a problem. We didn't realise at the time. And we went on, and we were all in great mood, but someone sadly lost their lives because they got squished up against the fence. I never knew that someone lost their lives. I yeah. knew there was a little bit of a rush and a crash and a God knows what and everything. Yeah, it's pretty sad. And sick. steps got canned off, didn't they? But yeah, well, they started throwing cans. My own fault, really. We, we yeah, you and I got a can out. Them. Yeah, I squirted them. They all chucked the cans on. A little H boy, you know, a little H, he went, dunk one on his head. I pissed myself. <laughs> but they, they loved it. And then we went, we sort of like did grip and groans, got in the old Chinooks. And that, that terrible thing, I bet they did it to you, where they go, do you want to do a bit of wing, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, what's it called, wing boarding or something, or, or tail boarding. And they sit, they said, you sit on the edge with your legs over the back of the, they put the ramp down at the back of the yeah. snook, and they put your legs like that. And they said, you'll be hooked on. Then they go over. into a climb and yeah, you start sliding Yeah, and they go like this, off. and you start sliding, and, and they held up the hook. <laughs> you bastard! It's a different hook. It's a it? different hook, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I did some great things. Going on the nuclear submarine, this is a classic. Because it was just before the, the next war, they were sending off extra sets. Is it extra? Ex, ex, no, there extra was. Uh, they were tea lap. They were. Um, what were they for cruise the Cruise missiles. They were for cruise missiles. Tomahawks. Tomahawks. Yeah, yeah. So, so From our basically, sub, you push yeah. him up and off so two go. SBS boys came up to me and they said, uh, "Would you come do a grip and grin if you want on the on the boat?" And I thought well, it was going to be a ship or something, you know. So I've turned up the next morning. These two SBS boys. I said, what, where's the boat then? They said, it's just around here. And we went and, and it was parked up against uh, an old fishing boat where they did the missiles that came from the fishing boat onto the thing overnight. Mm -hmm. and it was a nuclear submarine. And I went, I can't believe it. It was splendid. It probably was. It was very No, nice. it was called splendid. Oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so we go down, yeah, I know, I got it. <laughs> so we go down, which takes us everywhere. I looked at the nuclear the missiles and I looked at the, 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 the generator, you know, the one that plugs it in, the nuclear reactor. Yeah. It? And so they showed me around these SPS boys, all right, all lovely, jubbly. And he said, come through and say hello to the, uh, to the ops guy. And I walked into this little cabin place with a curtain. I went, hi, everyone, it's Bobby Dabro here. And they had all the maps. It was like the captain yeah. and the admiral, whoever it is. And, they, and all of a sudden, they covered all the maps up like yeah. this. And a big hand came around and grabbed my collar and yanked me out. And then uh, the SBS boys said, uh, come on, we better go now. I don't think, we, I don't think we've impressed them. And they took me scuba diving for my reward. And I went yeah. scuba diving for the first time. It's fantastic. The, dur during all that um, <clears throat> warm up, um, Donald Gosling, Sir Donald Gosling, as you know, yeah. was a great bloke and he gave so much money to the military. I mean, tons and tons. He was a great, great giver away of money to good causes. 
And he wanted to put on a show uh, on a submarine out somewhere or other off the coast of whatever, banging in those missiles into it. Yeah. And so he said, they've been there for ages and whatever. Can you come and do a show? I said, I can't. He said, well, do you think John Virgo will come? So I phoned up Virgo <laughs> and I said, you want to do a show <coughs> on that nuclear submarine? I don't go on a submarine. I've seen that film just bought you know, with, with all the Germans. I said, no, these things are huge. Well, what am I going to do? I said, well, you can do a snooker display. Honestly, well, they have a snooker table on board. I said, of course they will. These things are huge. They're like the ocean going liners. So they, they flew him out and he took a snooker cue. And he, <laughs> he, he, he landed at the airport and met by some sailors. And they said, hello, John. Uh, what are you up to? I'm going to go and do a show on a submarine. They went, oh, splendid. You went, oh, thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> he did that. And then he went on to Donald Gosling's, what was the name of his boat? Leander. He had a wonderful boat called Leander. And, uh, and all right, John, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm, do I'm doing a show on a submarine. <laughs> splendid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very nice. Yeah. And he said, where is it? And Donald said, it's just beneath us. Oh, all right. And it went to the side and came up. Wonderful. And John went down and uh, did a show. Had a look. It was fascinating to see it. I couldn't live down there for six months at a time. Oh, we don't well, no, few... these ones are not the six monthers. Th these ones don't have nuclear weapons, the ones that you looked at. They have nuclear propulsion. Oh, okay, See, what yeah. was called a hunter-killer. The big ones, yeah. the bombers, as they're called, that are based up in Fast Lane. They, 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 even the crew don't know where they're going. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Nor the navigator most no, of the time. Yeah, yeah. But they, they just left. sit there out the way, undetected and silent. And they're protected by the other submarines. Right. So that's our nuclear deterrent. Right we now, as we're watching this, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, stuff is going on out in Russia. And there's always that problem of a ballistic missile nuclear attack where let's hope that Mr. Putin realises that all our that. weapons are all trained on his bases as well as they're trained on ours. And it would be mutually assured destruction. Mad. Well, that's what so gets that's us. But these guys, they can't write home. They get like they can say, hello, I'm fine. A little mi little yeah, thing, that's message. it. A little one-liner. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And they're a good old bunch, aren't they? I don't do it entertaining the troops anymore because they're all too young. Well, we did this thing at Colchester when, when um, Two Power come back, didn't we? Went up to Colchester and did that. And they're all about 18 years old. Yeah. And they didn't really get... Well, you we, went actually, really we, well, didn't you? Oh, well, well, me and you. Apart we from went, the girl that he got up. Oh, Two yes. girls, Oh, right. they were the girls. They were, they were, they were one, gender. One was really lovely, really sexy, and the other one looked as if she could kick-start a tank. Yes. And she... <laughs> suck-start a Harley she, Davidson. She, she was... <laughs> no, I don't think she'd suck-start anything. No, I don't. She I was don't a bit flat-footed, if you know what I mean. I whatever. know what So mean, Bobby yeah. said, mm, you know, like, oh, trample, trample, trample. <laughs> and they're getting them to do things, and they didn't really want to do it. No. And he said... I've always wanted to shag a woman in leopard skin trousers. <laughs> and this one that was a bit butch had leopard skin trousers on. So this is how it went. I've always wanted to shag a girl in leopard skin trousers. She went, oh. He said, could you lend your mate your trousers? <laughs> That's right. I normally do it about glasses. <laughs> I always get a woman out with the glasses. It's slightly sexist joke, but, it, it, you know, as I say, it's a bit of fun, isn't it? All our jokes it. are sexist. It's yeah, but there are people fun. used to love it. People laugh. They're jokes. Yeah. That's what it's about. Talking of jokes, yeah. I've bought you something. A joke? No. Mm. Now, you went to school about the same time as me, is that right? But I passed eight, quarter to nine. Mm. All right. And do you remember, <laughs> here we go, gag alert, this is the gag bit. Tell them about what a joke is when I get this story. A joke, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for you young people watching this, <laughs> people. is what grown-ups laugh at. It is someone else's misfortune, normally. So, what's that? Uh, right. I was one of them. Right. Now, these used to be like... How um, do you remember they make that? I didn't. Do you I remember them things that used to go clap like that? Uh, it's clap. Yes. Yeah. They used to be like, yeah, I mean, clap. Clap. Yeah, you had to clap as well, did you? The clap. I yeah, had to clap. There was another <laughs> things you made that went like that, just that, like a beak. Like well, a, I'm th this is, well, I don't know what this is called. This is called a... It's called, it called? A, like a make-a-wish thing. Yeah. And you used, to, you used to do that, didn't you? But, uh, yeah. So basically, what I've done, I right, look it up to find out how, because I'm not like, I'm black belt in origami. And uh, you know, like, the, the answer to simple origami is twofold. It's twofold. Let's, oh, well, let's not, I'll read that once. That's it. So I'll, I'll give. Uh, what's his Ladies name? and gentlemen, despite uh, Bobby <laughs> Dabro, keep donating. Text <laughs> donate to double six treble seven while this yeah. idiot tries to dig himself out the shit here. Right. Go on, right. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Right. So I had to look up how this is made. All right. Yeah. So you have to get a big, you've got to be a square piece of paper. Yeah. A bit of card. And you basically have to fold it a certain way, and then it comes this. And it, I don't know what they're called. 
and you do this, right? Yeah. So well, I'm going to do this now. What I've done, I've written a joke. There's, uh, I think there's a eight short numbers. joke. Well, no, no, it's a, a subject of ah. a joke, and it's completely ad lib. This a so, genre, a genre of jokes, right? So we'll start with you. You pick a colour. Blue. B L U E. Pick a number from one to eight. Hang on, why's it got blue on the outside? All right, one to eight. One to what? One eight. to eight. Three. One, two, three. Right, now you can see in there, look, there's a number. Can you see that? That's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Pick any of those numbers. Two. Number two, and I open it up, and the joke you've got to tell me, oh, it's a knob gag. You've got to tell me your favourite knob gag. Favourite knob joke. Okay. Go on. Um, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me think of a big knob. Go on, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I got one. My knob is the same length as an Argos pen. Oh. Right? And the other thing you don't know about me is that I'm not allowed back, back in Argos again. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Oh, I've got a blister What's the, on the first end? thing that comes out of an old man's knob when he makes love? I don't know. What is the first thing that comes out of an old man's knob when he's making love? The wrinkles. The wrinkles. Or dust in your case as well. <laughs> I'm mine. Don't. Are, are I you a dust puffer? I am, puffer? I'm afraid. I I'm am. afraid. My fucking dick is like a press stud at is the it? moment. Like it is. It's like a five, a five, granny's six. Granny's light switch. You oh. always tell me my my. It goes in, doesn't it? Your knob goes oh, in. I can't. I don't know. It's awful. My use it like... to or lose it, Bob. I can't, I'm not using it. I've got, I've got a blister on the end of it. Well, it isn't actually a blister. It's Vicky's contact lens. Do another one. Do another one. Right. Okay. I just did a chop. My wife does that. Oh, do another gap. Right. Green. Green. G R E E N. Shoey green. Shoey green. Yeah, he failed me did. for an audition once. Did he? At Opturns in Oxford. He called me over. You went to Nella Hall. I went. And I did, did Nella Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I went and did the same audition around. Did you yeah. fail too? Uh, oh, of course. Yeah, I'd be on it. Yeah. And then he got VD, didn't he? Got hundred on the clapometer. That was the gag. <laughs> was the gag we used to have about Huey Green. It was. That was Bernie Flint. If you can't remember the name Bernie Flint, just put. <laughs> you know, no. What do you mean? What do you mean? Bernie right. Flint was a great Number. guy. No, one. Number one. Okay. Right, let's do this. Let me open it up. That's number one. I can't remember what I've written down here. Animal gag. An animal gag. Animal Once gag. upon a time, Noah decided that he'd take two of every animal in the world, children, on, onto a ark because it was going to piss down with rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible describes it well. <laughs> what it didn't describe is the amount of shit on board would that a lot. boat. Would have been a lot on the ark. Oh, yes, yes, it was terrible. There was shit all over the place. Everywhere. It was in the fucking... I, there was a little story of a rabbit that was walking <laughs> along. After a proclamation was made by the lion, listen here, there's too much shit going on in this ark, so there's now a desiccated area at the front of the boat, that's the bow for all you dolphins on board, and it's marked off with white gaffer tape and you shit there and def nowhere else. Area. Defecated area. If anyone area. shits in the undesignated area, <laughs> they'll be eaten by myself or my wife. Do I make myself clear? Right, so be it. One day, <laughs> I know the guy getting at it. A little rabbit was doing number twos <clears throat> in a in a hallway, in a companion way, and a giraffe went, "Oi, what?" Do you realise that you could be eaten by the lion for shitting in this passageway? I don't care. He could eat me if he wants because I'm fed up with it. It's all right for you big tall animals going down there. It's fucking knee deep in shit. I, I, it, for us little ones, it is a nightmare. I was down there the other day having a crap and a big grizzly bear <laughs> said to me, Oi, rabbit. I said, what? He said, does shit stick to your fur? I said, yes, it fucking does. <laughs> well, he did no more. But picked me up and wiped his arse with me. <laughs> I can't follow that. There no. was another one about the monkey that was laughing, wasn't it? About they had to hang their cocks up because they didn't want to reproduce on the ark. And the bloke and the monkey was laughing and, he, and they gave them raffle tickets. Didn't they? Go on, what's the joke? I can't remember it. it was, uh, oh, that's not that was, a no, one, that Right, one. Noah gave all the animals raffle tickets. Leave your cocks out there. Right? Yeah. Mm. And um, the monkey got... Oh, and, he, and he was laughing and, and the lion says... Why are you laughing? He says, I've got the elephant's raffle ticket. Oh, yeah, you would. It was a gag, isn't it? I can't remember. But he didn't think his ass could take another one of them sticky buns. buns let me get it. you at it now. Right, and you oh, have a see if you can do it. <coughs> Hello. I don't know whether I have me tea <coughs> with me squirrel mug. <coughs> Hello. 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 Right, red, white, can blue. Can I tell you something that reminds Pink. me of? What? You were sat when we went to poor old Kenny Lynch's funeral. Yeah. And you were sat next to me. 
in yeah, the coffin. Yeah, I made Kenny Lynch in. talk in his and coffin. And you made him talk I? in the coffin. I was trying not to laugh. <clears throat> it was, it was the funniest. being carried in. Yeah, Tarby was yeah, carrying yeah. him in, a lot of them. And as the coffin went past, it was all a bit sad, and we're it all a bit sick. Sad. As the coffin went past, I went, <laughs> I went, who's that? <clears throat> let me out. Let me out. <laughs> Kenny, it's Kenny. All right. Hello, Kenny. There was a joke. How do you make Kenny Lynch's cock 12 inches long? You fold it in half. <laughs> <laughs> right, go on, on. do it. I'm going to go pink. I'm going to go Get pink. the ice cream man outside. Oh, oh no, that's my son Freddie calling me on the phone. Hang on, Fred. Oh, He's probably, probably watching this. Pink. Freddy, it's pink. got a lot of letters in pink. P P I N P I N K. Right. Um, uh, I'll go eight. <laughs> and I'll go, uh, I'll go, um, let's have a look, yeah, I'll go eight again. Open up eight, and they'll have a subject on it. Wife gags. Oh, okay. Right, before you do the wife gags, tell them what you did at when your best man's speech at my wedding. Yes. Go on, You tell come them. up to me, he said, hello, Bobs, he said, this is Michelle, she's my fifth wife. And I looked at her, I said, she wouldn't be my first choice either. Yeah, but where did you tell ah, that joke? Ah, ah, ah. Um, you're my best man speech. Best you did man it to speech. the congregation. And they all laughed. Wife gags. Wife gags. When it's I'm a very sore point for you, isn't well, it? Well, I've wife. only had one, haven't I? Only old ex-wife. Yeah, yeah, but she you know makes what she up for five of mine. Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> you collected them. Yeah. My ex-wife, um, she once told me that she could never live without me. Yeah. Yeah. And I found out last week she's still alive. Oh, that's yeah. awful, isn't it? Yeah. When that I married her, she had big tits and long legs. What now? Now she's got long tits and big legs. Uh, I said to mine, mine the other night, so we were in bed together, oh, yeah. and, uh, and she said, what were you thinking 20 years ago when we first slept? I said, well, I was thinking that I'd like to suck your brains out. And she said, and what are you thinking now? And I'm thinking, what a fucking good job I must have done. <laughs> I love it. Kidding. Right, here we go. Here we go. Right, have another go. I'll have, um, I'll, hang on, I haven't made my mind up yet. Orange. Oh, whoops. <laughs> How do you spell orange? O R. Orange. Orange. O R A N G E. O R A N G E. Right, okay. I'll have a four, five, six, or eight. Seven. There ain't a seven. Oh, I'll have a four then. No, no, I'll have a. I'll have a. Your fingers and thumbs. Not like you. Four, number. Number, I'll have a number seven. Just get a seven. There ain't a fucking seven. Do the extra bit. It's a seven on there for sure. Seven. Is there seven? Do you know what this is? Seven's he my knows lucky he's number. put seven. He knows there's no. a thing on there which has got the best joke in the world. No, it hasn't. Well, I'll change it then. Yeah, seven. Seven. Right. Seven. What's it? Squivial jokes. No, <laughs> they're in Mindale. Sex, sex gags. Oh, for goodness sake. Sex you wrote these. You must know some. You know millions. You know well, every you know joke in the world. You know all the jokes as well. Sex. I remember the first time I had sex. I was terrified. Yeah. I was what? on my own. Oh, no. Yeah. I had really? my first threesome last week. Did you? Two no shows. <laughs> Are you talking about that? Have you? Oh. You're a single bloke now, aren't you? Oh, yes. Yeah, but you've got Vicky, you and Vicky here. Yeah, single, everywhere. but not single. I don't single. know where we are at the moment. Would you ever go on Tinder? No. I tried it once and I had a terrible experience. I was typing in, it, it, what you have to do, right, uh, is I didn't have much luck with it. And my mate said, well, try taking your photograph off, you might have a bit more luck. It's a terrible joke. So I was tapping and you have to put all the things that you enjoy, like your, your, your sexual, come up with what is your sexual yeah. Preference. Yeah. So I'm tapping in there. I'm going to like this. I like shagging page three girls. I didn't realise, but the P wasn't working on my keyboard. <laughs> Terrible problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's like like wearing your speedos in the swimming pool and the S falls off. Falls off the logo. <laughs> Sex jokes. Okay. Come on, being tell married. Us your my wife was so pissed the other evening in bed. She came up to me and she said, "Yeah." Why don't you turn that bedside light out and then, if you want, you can come over here and shove it up my ass. Well, looking back, I should have let that bulb cool down a bit, shouldn't <laughs> it's I? It's a classic. <laughs> I actually tried the old uh, going, you know, what? trying on the trapeze hat, as you call it. What, trying on the trapeze hat? But I was Chewing on the fur burger? Chewing on the fur burger, Ooh. yeah. Saying hello, hello. Barking you know, at the Busby? Barking at the Busby. But and I was what very drunk. Mm. And I said, you're very dry down here. She said, you're licking the carpet. Oh, no. Yeah. Do one more for luck. <laughs> These are jokes, folks. <laughs> jokes, yeah. folks. 
Right, Not one for more woke. for luck, and then I've got a contest for you. Oh, great. Right. I'll just do number five. We don't have that project. Mm-hmm. Food gags. Oh, food gags. Right, well, you go first. You're a good cook. I'm a what? Good cook. Yeah. you got your own brand of sausages, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah, the Jim Davidson sausages. What are they? Well, it, well, it doesn't have your name on it. It's just got prick with a fork on it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, hit me. Hit me. Hit me with one. Food. food. Jaffa cakes. Jaffa now, cakes. who... What was the catchphrase with the mad Jaffa cake eater? It was Welsh. It was Welsh. He said, there's orangey. There's orangey. That was it. And do you know... Was that it? Do you know who the mad Jaffa cake eater was? I bet I can... T- it's Victor Spinetti. Victor Spinetti. I do recall him. I did panto with him. He was I did panto with I him. He Victor was the Spinetti. best villain I've ever seen. Yeah. But when it comes to pantomime, you've got to be a villain that scares the kids, but you've got to do it in a camp way. You've got to do it in a funny way. He yeah. was brilliant. Well, the reason he was brilliant is because I directed him. Good boy. Thank you. Get a Jaffa cake out and show me this bullshit. Yes, you're now do. this is And you can do this at home, folks. And don't forget, donate, OK? You've got to text donate to double six trouble seven. It won't keep on it. Yeah, you know what the deal is. Kind of. What's his camera? Why come he's got a better camera than me? I've got a real shitty box camera. He's got a real <laughs> fucking like the Hubble telescope. Now, at this it. takes a lot of practice. What is it? <laughs> Put the Jaffa cake on your head, chocolate side down. Yeah. And you've got to get it yeah. in your mouth without touching it with your fingers. I will now demonstrate. Ready? Here we go. Someone at the door while you're doing that. Oh, hang on. You're doing a Patrick Moore eye. How good are you? I'm Patrick Moore. <laughs> this Jaffa cake represents the moon. Right, hang on a minute. It's got some. Go on. There he is. Hang on. It's stuck. No, it's moving. No, it ain't. It's, it's like a fucking glacier. Well, yeah, do oh, there it. you go, look. Oh, look, here it is. <laughs> All the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making impressions while I'm doing it. Oh, uh, matrix. Well. Uh. Ah! Genius! Lovely. You have a go. You have to take your glasses off. Oh, look. Oh, see? Good stuff. Fingers and thumbs you are today. I am. Yeah, I'll look after them for you. I'll do me Stephen Hawking for you. Oh, this will really get shut down. Yeah. Right, so it's got to go in my mouth. Hang on, yeah? hang on. I'm doing Stephen. No, you do. You're doing chocolate face down. Oh, go on. Do Stephen Hawking. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to you doing the Jaffa Cake Challenge. It is all about cosmology. Go on, you do it. God, sorry, Stephen. One of my heroes. <laughs> Chocolate, s- no, this is a p- chocolate face down. That's it. Chocolate, uh, that's it. Now, just use your face muscles. I ain't got any. Tra- I've had Botox. <laughs> You've had Botox. That's it. Keep it going. Keep it. <laughs> oh, oh, you're doing oh, well. Oh. No! Ah! You're Fuck rushing it. it. Have another go. Um. No, chocolate, chocolate face down. <laughs> Look, he don't believe you. <laughs> oh, he's cheating. No. no. Oh, that's fucking horrible. Yeah, right, right, I've got one for you. All right, then. Uh, Jake, have you got a stopwatch on your uh, iPhone? What's this then? This is. Yeah. We're going to start doing this on the new series of Sunday Night Live. This is the Listerine Challenge. Okay. Right, so when you're ready to say go, hang on. Hang on, let me see. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 looking at it. Okay, your time starts now. Great. Oh, getting ready. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> I'm nearly there, nearly there. Hang on. Ah! Ah, how long was it? Uh, 13.89 seconds. Oh, not great. Mm, yeah. Right, now you've got you to get the lid off. So have a go. 13 point what? 8.9. 8.9. Right, OK. Jake, you ready? Okay. On your marks, sit, go. Oh, you're struggling, you're struggling. Tick, tick. <laughs> so far, I'm in the lead. It's a bit like Top Gear, isn't it? Where you got you put it on a on a on a on a chart. Best time. Yeah, be like so, that. Yeah. You should keep it. Are you doing an Easter panto this year? I am. Where are you we're going? It. We're going all over the place. Don't ask me where, but we're starting off in Dorking and about to so on the second of April, and then we go up to right up to Scotland and back. If you get a chance, to, if you get a chance to see Bobby do this, I really think he's the best 
pantomime operator that there is going. And I love watching him. And I love watching all the lovies and the theatre people and the crew and everyone saying, oh, does he have to behave like that? What do you mean, does he have to behave like that to get a stand innovation every time he comes on? Yes, is the answer. OK, lovelies, well done. Bobby, smashing. Lovely. We look forward to seeing your story with Face to Face with Alex Belfield and, of course, your continued appearances on, uh, on Sunday Night Live. I'll play you out, I'll play you out, because this is something I've learned in the lockdown. I've got Can to you? Do this. Oh, I can play the mouth organ. I haven't got it out yet, my obvious. Oh, sorry. It's my, it's my clarinet. Oh, is it? <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> You've got a mouth organ, though. I saw you with it earlier. <laughs> yes, you want to get my organ in your mouth. OK, just give it a blow to start with. It could blow. That'll do, that'll do, that'll do. I dropped it down the toilet about half an hour ago, which was practising. I've learnt Happy Birthday, on, and I've learnt um, the beginning of Piano Man. We can't do Piano Man because of copyright. Oh. We'll have to give all the money that's raised to the bloke oh, who wrote then. it. Edit that Ingleburg bit. Ingleburg Ampadink, wouldn't it? <laughs> Happy Birthday. I messed up a little bit. Again, shocking. I've got right. more notes in Show my off. pocket. Ready? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Chaffer what's Kate. It? What's it? <laughs> <laughs> Get the listener in. Okay, Jake, what's on next? I love, I love that moment of the gym as well, as you can say what you want. Because political correctness has gone up the fucking wall, hasn't it? <laughs> so if I see what Exactly, that's the type of gig we want tonight. And to be honest, I have put my lucky underpants on for you lot tonight. And I was looking for them before I left the house. The thing is, lads, we think we know where things are, don't we? Eh? Whereas ladies actually do know where things are. So before I left the house earlier, right, I'm looking for my black Callum and Clown underpants. I think they're in the top drawer in my bedroom, right? So I'm looking for them and I can't find them. So I shout downstairs to me, Mrs. Babe, yeah, where's my black Callum and Clown underpants that I like to wear for me gigs? They're upstairs in the top drawer where they always are. I'm looking, I can't find them. <laughs> they're not. They are. They're not. They are. They're not. They are. They're not. They are. I better go up there and I bet I'll find them. And they do, don't they, lads? <laughs> uh. In the most patronising manner you can ever possibly imagine. And the thing is, girls, you're that good, right? You don't even have to look in the drawer, do you? Uh. They just stick their hand in and go, what's these? <laughs> and it makes you wonder, you know all these myths at the Loch Ness Monster? All these people have been going down there in all this scientific equipment trying to find it. No one's ever found it. Just get your fucking missus, she'd find it straight away, wouldn't she? <laughs> all these people round the lock, your missus is like that, out the way. Fucking what's this? <laughs> Even the Loch Ness Monster's shocked, you know? He's like, who the fuck did you just do that? <laughs> you absolute bitch. <laughs> do you know what? I'm doing there, mind my own business, getting my fucking nails done right, and you just fucking grab me by the scruff of the neck. <laughs> How camp is the Loch Ness Monster, by the way? <laughs> Hi, everybody! It's me, Ozzy, uh... uh Thanks, thanks, yeah, I was Osborne, and I thought I'd just come and tell you that I, I, I was out in Africa once, right, on a, saf on a, saf on a saf f surfboard, safari, I was on a safari, right, and I was walking down through the, the National Kujaguar Park, or whatever the it was, anyway, and all of a sudden, right, the fucking great lion came out of the trees, and he went, Rah! Oh, shit myself! No, then, when I just went, Rah! Oh, Jesus Christ. Sharon! <laughs> oh, fuck. Well, folks, that's the end of a long old night. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you had a good old laugh. And I'll be letting you know in a day or so how much money we have all raised tonight on Red, White and Blue Nose Day. Take care of yourselves, folks, and we'll see you for Sunday Night Live. <laughs>